Think of that. And he was up there just trembling and shaking, trying to hit the ball. I was with Andrew Bell, sitting right there watching all that mess going on. Now today, a black man is the president of the National Football League. Black man is the president of the Ford Foundation. Black man, the president of the biggest pension plan in the world, the Teachers Insurance Annuity Association. I never thought I would live to see any of that take place. And it had all happened. A black man is the governor of Virginia where slavery was invented. A black man, the mayor of New York City. Now these things I never dreamed I would see. So when somebody at 19, 20, 20, or 21 years old can say to me, listen man, I don't know where you're coming from with all that optimism, things are not going to change anymore. How do you know? How do you know? If you keep saying that, that's the best guarantee that things will not change anymore. You see, nobody in the world ever tried to do what black folk are trying to do in America. Here's another term paper for you. Those of you who are in anthropology, check this out. Nobody ever spent 244 years in chattel slavery, another 100 years in apartheid, and then decided to stay on the same piece of real estate with the former masters and work toward the center of the society. Nobody. Completely unprecedented. Look at all of the oppressed minorities around the world and see if you can find one situation similar to that. Now, I started in, in, in New Zealand, the Maori picture for the Ministry of Education over there. The Maoris look differently. The Maoris have their own culture intact. And they are 10% minority, and many of them feel deprived. But the Maori situation in New Zealand is not like ours over here, because the Maoris were there a thousand years before the Anglo-Saxons came. That's not the similar situation. Not the same at all. Likewise, likewise, in India, there was a minority on the bottom, called an outcast group, it's outlawed now, but they were there. Is that like our situation? No, not in the exact detail, because they've been in that same Hindu culture for 2,500 years. I want you to know that there have been a great many minority problems in the world, but there's not one where people started where we started in this country, and people who stuck to it and decided not to give up. Oh, it's painful sometimes. It's terrible and awfully unbearable sometimes. But when I consider what we're trying to do, it is well worth all of the effort. When this is over with, something grander than Alexander's march from Macedonia into India, something more marvelous than the Rome of Augustus Caesar or the Athens of Pericles. We're trying to build a model for a pluralistic, diverse society with a constitution with seven short paragraphs and its amendments agglutinating 260 million people. And those who are farthest down on the bottom are working their way toward the center of the society. No need to talk about all these things about how black you want to be or how much you want to be agglutinated, amalgamated into it. All of these academic questions you can debate about all night long. I'm talking about basic fairness, job opportunity, educational opportunity, housing, and then let the good times roll right on. Nobody's ever tried it. And that's why nobody can be so absolute about whether it can happen, how fast, how slowly, all we can say is we're going to keep on working on it until we see this thing come to pass. I'm going to be 70 years old in July, and I'm going to hang around another 10 years. I'm going to work on it every minute of that time because I don't know anything better to use my life for than to see this experiment come to one happy conclusion. The next thing is, our young people will have to know that no matter what has been said, no matter how many rumors have been spread, we can do anything anybody else can do. You know, when I went to Crozier Seminary, I didn't tell you this about that place. When King came along, it was quite a different place. A very, very intellectually stimulating seminary. But when I got there, they gave jobs to everybody in the auditorium, and I'm the only black dude sitting in there. We were in black then, I forgot what we were then. I think we were colored at that time. I'm so old, I've been everything. I don't know, but we were colored at that time. You know, they gave me the job cleaning the pots and pans and scrubbing in the kitchen. I was so hurt. And you mean to tell me, everybody here is white, and I'm the only black one here, and they are gonna send me to the kitchen to wash the pots and pans. 
They didn't announce that when they announced all other jobs. They waited until everybody else had gone and said, Mr. Proctor, Mrs. Morris wants to see you in the kitchen. I went down there. This was a lady who was a Polish immigrant fleeing Hitler, could hardly speak English. The minute she saw me, she said, you the one to work with me here? Yes, ma'am. I'd already made up my mind they were not going to drive me out of there and make me go home. She said, oh, you the only colored boy in the school? Yes, ma'am. She took her dirty apron and lifted it to her face like she was crying. She says, why they send you here? You the only colored boy. Now here's a Polish exile from Hitler's invading of Poland. And she had enough awareness of the situation here to say that to me. I'll never forget Mrs. Mort saying that to me. And when I heard that, then I understood what existentialism was all about. Existentialism, I'm talking about the immediacy of the truth and knowledge coming right vertically through the crown of your head. When I heard that woman say, did they send you down here? And here comes the truth. Mrs. Mort, would you like for me to stay down here? You want to stay? Yes, ma'am, I do. I knew right then I was going to learn more about Christian ethics and prophetic religion with that woman, that cook down there, than I was going to learn upstairs with those PhDs. This woman had understood something about justice and fairness. We had a ball. Ooh, we had a good time. I taught that woman how to cook greens, and she didn't know. Poor, poor thing, she didn't understand what to do with a pot of greens, you know. I took her downtown and bought her some ham hock, you know, <laughs> and, let that, and let that ham hock float and boil in those greens a while. And those greens came to a new height of dignity when they got in touch with some ham hock, you know. And then I remember when I told her about a sweet potato pie. You make a pie out of sweet potatoes? <laughs> Sister Marsh, you've never seen a sweet potato so happy as when it is in a sweet potato pie. We had a good time. She would cook all that good stuff for me and leave it in the warmer. Everybody else walking around there losing weight, getting anemic, you know, and I'm just chopping away. Mother Morris, I, I gained weight, jaws got fat, you know. We just fell in love and had a good time. Now, do you know that when I graduated from Crozer Seminary, starting off washing the pots and pans, I didn't ask for any favors. I did what I was supposed to do. I made mostly A's in my subjects. I loved it. I mean, I just got into it. They gave me the Crozer Fellowship, the biggest prize they had, $2,500 a year. Today it would be $25,000 to go to Yale to start my PhD degree. Later on, they appointed me to the faculty. Later on, they made me a trustee. And three years ago, they asked me to be the president of Crozer Theological Seminary, the same place where they handed me the mop and the Brillo pads and showed me where the hot water was. The day came, the day came when they asked me to be the president of the same seminar. See, when you see something like that happen, you know that we don't have all of the answers about change. And finally, let me say this to you. You and I, this generation will have to keep this country alive and affirmative to the principle of justice and fairness. That principle is so fragile, it needs a lot of protection. You know, President Bush can go around and find black folk from somewhere, I don't know where he finds these folk from, who can do their own people in because they have no perception. A young black man, young PhD, came in to be Assistant Secretary of Labor, and before he could hang his hat up and find out where the toilet paper was, he's around there passing out an edict that all scholarships for black folk are going to have to be canceled. Isn't that some heroic act for him to pull off now? The president didn't ask him to do it. The court didn't ask him to do it. The Barker decision didn't require it. Nobody asked him to do it. He thought that up to show what a loyal disciple he was to the right wing in this society. God forgive me for the things I have called him under my breath. <laughs> the, the names I have assigned to him. You know, cheap success. I know everybody hates the niggas, so if I come in here and use my power to show them that I can be intelligent about hating them, then I may get to be elevated to something else. What cheap and vulgar ways to use our days. And behind it all lies that notion that 
We don't plan to be fair. And if you can think of clever ways to be unfair, announce them now. We want to hear all the nasty ways of undoing all the things that were done in the 60s and 70s. That's what I hear. Justice and fairness. John Rawls at Harvard wrote a wonderful book called The Theory of Justice. I never get tired of reading that book. He's a British philosopher. He says, you know, people think that the core of ethics is utilitarianism, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number. He said, but somebody's got to say what the greatest good is. If you're in power, you could say this is the greatest good, and therefore if the greatest number ought to embrace it, and that makes it right. No, there ought to be some objective measure of what the greatest good ought to be. And Rawls wrote 476 pages telling us what the greatest good ought to be. Here's what he said, very much like Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. Immanuel Kant would say, you live in such a way that your conduct could become the rule for all humankind, and that's the greatest good. That's a binder, isn't it? Like St. Augustine said, love God and do as you please. <laughs> That's a tough one to love God and then do as you please because then what you would please would be to please God, you see. You know? Some of these axiomatic things will make us sit up and think. But Raw said we all come into the world at an original position. You don't bring anything in the world with you. You come here buck naked, dependent. You haven't earned anything. Talk about a meritocracy. You haven't earned anything. Then some people look up and see station wagons and neatly manicured lawns and basketball and tennis and ballet lessons and grandma and grandpa and ponies and swimming pools. At the original position, they look up and find all of that showered on them. Somebody else came into the world at the original position and there was nothing but alcoholism and ignorance and, and poverty everywhere. What a difference. Now Rawl says now, if you inherited undeserved benefits, things you did not earn at all, what right have you got to accept these things knowing other people inherited deficits and impediments that they did not deserve? The only way you can justify yours is that you would try to help those persons to rise up to a position at which they could earn alongside you those outcomes that all of us would like for ourselves. You know, I understand that perfectly well. You know why I understand it? Because I came into the world with a whole lot more than I ever deserved. I had a daddy who played the violin, who read poetry, taught in the Sunday school, loved all of his six children, took us to church every Sunday all day long, taught us how to play ball, how to swim. My daddy was into his children's lives. All of us went to college. Three or four of us earned doctor's degrees. Daddy didn't have the money, but daddy prayed you right on through all of your trials. What a wonderful daddy. Now, mama, I don't ever remember my mama doing anything but working for her six children. I have no image of that woman doing anything except sewing, cooking, washing, ironing, investing in us. I came into the world, and worse than that, had a grandmother who was born a slave and whose owner sent her to Hampton Institute where she graduated in 1882. Here when I was a little boy with my little fat jaws and Popeyes, I had a grandmother following me around the house who went to school with Booker T. Washington and wouldn't let me split a verb or the infinitive form of the verb. <laughs> I had a whole lot more than what I deserved. So when I see a little kid coming to, Cam coming to Rutgers out of Camden, New Jersey, splitting verbs, no sense of pride, not caring what he or she wears or what kind of presentation he or she would make, I say, Sam, you're mortgaged one more time. You're obligated to this child here who came into the world with deficits undeserved. And you came into the world with all of these assets undeserved, Sam. Down in Clinton, South Carolina, <laughs> funniest thing I ever saw in my life, I saw a great big football player walking around there, great big guy out of chapel. He stopped me. He said, uh, man, he said, I like that sermon you gave. I wish you'd come down here again. And I looked, and there was peeping around him a very small girl, a midget, a dwarf, large cranium, small frame, thick calves in her legs, and small. Every time he took one step, she took three or four. And the president was beside me, a man named Dr. Orr, and I said, what is this? Uh, 
He said, that's brother and sister. Oh, <laughs> genetics just went wild. And he's a giant. And here she is, three feet tall. He says, yeah. He said, and then I'm going to say I'm their twins. Twins? Tell me about this. He said, you know, when he finished high school in South Carolina, he was the best ball player down here. He was so smart, so fast, he could snatch balls out, of, could run and kick and knock folk down, carry four or five people across the goal line with him, you know, and leave three or four people injured on the ground. Every time he ran through, they needed the ambulances to clean up behind him, you know. He, he was terrible. All the big teams sent their little station wagons snaking all around the county, trying to find him and talk with his mom and daddy. And you know what he told them? He said, if you want me to come to your cottage, you got to give a scholarship to my sister. And we can't arrange that. And, they did. And, and by the way, I talked to school folk around South Carolina, and they know that fella. And they know that fella. He said, uh, my sister didn't ask to be born like that. And he said, and, and I didn't ask to be born the way I am. Here I am with a good mind and a strong body. Here she's got this cross to bear all of her life. What do you think I'm supposed to do? Run on off? Get on television, get a pro contract, and leave her here to be put in the circus, to jump up and down on stools with cats and dogs and trained animals to make a living? Leave her here to have her heart broken? He said, I don't want my sister crying in the dormitory, peeping out of the window while everybody's having a good time. She can't go to a dance, she can't play tennis, she can't swim. She doesn't have anything that she can do but grieve her heart out for her life's condition, and I'm going on toward fame and fortune. No, you can have your television. Clemson nearly died, they couldn't get him. Clemson on television. You can have your television, you can have your pro contract, but I'm gonna be where my sister is, at Little Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. Heard him say that, gave him a scholarship, gave his sister one. And I looked up, and there he was walking across the campus, just as contented as he could be. And he and his sister swinging hands and playing, going down the sidewalk. He said, where I am, she's going to be. As though he was saying, I don't know any other kind of way to live except to mortgage my social capital to enhance her quality of life so she can work for those same outcomes that all of us want so much. That point has got to be made. So now, instead of going in a corner, you know, crying and cussing and thinking thoughts that have no productivity, start thinking about how that point can be made in this society today so that this noble experiment and the wonderful efforts begun by Martin Luther King can be completed and that right early. Thank you very kindly. minutes and you're not tired yet. Now you know how I must have felt 20 years ago at Abyssinia Baptist Church as I listened to this qualitative speaker. And now you must know why when he retired from Rutgers University in 1984, they named him Martin Luther King Professor Emeritus and awarded him the Records Medal for Distinguished Service. And I am just overcome at this moment. Now you know. He's going to award you about 15 minutes of question and answers if you have some. Yes. No question can be embarrassing here in school, aren't we? And this is where questions ought to be asked. Yes. Question. Yes, sir, Professor. I hear often and notice the prediction that by the year 2000 there will be no black farmers in the southeast. 
It, uh, it's a sad prediction. I just left the Southeast. I just left East Carolina State <laughs> University where black farmers used to be extremely prosperous in that part of the country, around Pitt County and in that area. It's sad, but um, all the little mom and pop stores are gone too. It's not just black farmers. All of the little drug stores are gone. My, my wife's father owned three little itty bitty pharmacies in black communities, one in Lawrenceville, Virginia, and one in uh, Alexandria, one in Fredericksburg. People's Drug Store, you know, and Eckerd and Kmart came and they just gobbled them all up. They've got bigger pharmacies in the corners of the supermarkets than he had, you know. And so this is not the day when the small uh, farmer can make it. Now, with some training and some entrepreneurship, some of those farmers can come together and do what the big farmers are doing. I just don't know what's happening through our ag and tech, uh, you know, agricultural uh, extension service. I have no idea what kind of program they're advocating. I don't know what the government is doing to let three and four farmers come together and buy those big pieces of equipment, you know, and do their marketing on a big scale and make corporations themselves. I don't think they ought to have to sit there with their teeth in their mouths and watch themselves being gobbled up. I think some real entrepreneurship ought to take place uh, there. And I think someone else has to help them. Other people don't do it on their own. You know, they get help from people who are in the banking business and investment people like that. They help them get started. And it may be that, uh, you know, some of our big agriculture centers ought to be showing them how to get some specialized crops, you know, and how to get the equipment and how to come together and pool their resources and make some profits and not get, you know, bought off one right after another. But it is a sad commentary and you're exactly correct. See, you used to have little mom and pop restaurants, little fish and chip stores, and here came McDonald's, you know, <laughs> and Burger King. Now, I've got buddies now who own four and five McDonald's. They, they never did own little restaurants. But they died in on the McDonald's wave, you know what I mean? Two or three of them were, were college teachers and quit teaching and went into hamburger business. Yes. Yes, I saw, well, I saw another hand right here, then I'll come back there. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Dr. Proctor, I was just going to ask Stand up so everybody can hear your question. Um, I was going to ask you if you had ever met Malcolm X, and there were a lot of indications that had Malcolm not been assassinated, that perhaps Malcolm and his movement could have fused with Dr. King and the movement could have been, you know, one and cohesive. I would just like your impressions on that. Uh, fusing the movements like that, probably not. But I think that Malcolm X would have been a whole lot closer to King's position than the leaders of the movement now would be to King's position. Uh, Malcolm X uh, wasted unfortunately a large part of his youth with another lifestyle and uh, when he got in stride and started really you know facing up the whole world you know uh, he changed his ideas a lot and he went on that trip out to the far uh, out to the near east and came back with a lot of revisions in his thinking and maybe that contributed to his death i don't know i'm not that close to the dynamics of it but uh, people do grow and they change it is not cowardice or fear, just more facts pouring in, more of a sense of history and reality, you see. I don't know if they would have merged and fused uh, completely, but uh, I think they would have been closer together. Yes. Uh, and you know, they talked about that a lot. You know, King used to talk to me about, uh, about that a lot. You know. Yes, the hand I saw back here, sir. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a tough question. It's a tough question? Let's try and see how tough it is. They took the rights movement that we don't have a king or we don't have a Malcolm X, and maybe that's why things seem to be uh, hopeless. Do you see anyone in today's, uh, in the forefront of today's black America who could actually take that place as a quote unquote civil rights leader? Or, as you said, the situation has changed. Do you, do you think that now you picked up on, you answered your own question. The situation is so different that uh, it's hard to create. See, Jesse Jackson is out there now. All he needs is a Rosa Parks. 
But there is no Rosa Parks out there fine. Did you hear what I said? Huh? When King was moving, you did not have a black governor of Virginia. You see how much steam that takes out of the movement in Virginia if you got a black governor? And by the way, he's not a very radical governor for that matter. He's a very middle of the road kind of a person. But you see how much that diffuses the thing? When Malcolm X was in New York, you did not have a black mayor. So you go jumping and running and snapping at the mayor, you snap and got another black man. <laughs> see how different it is? And you gotta have a sense of history. You gotta say, this has changed. Now what are the new strategies? Tell me this, who is the great Italian leader in America today? Don't say Cuomo because uh, Cuomo is the leader of all of New York State. He would he'd be the first one to say, don't call me an Italian leader, I'm a leader of New York State. Who is the great Greek leader today? Who is the great Jewish voice today? There is no such thing. And black folk aren't going to have any such thing again. You're not going to have any one messiah. You're going to have a messiah out here in Iowa, and another one will be down in Alabama, and another one here, Marion Wright Edelman will work for the Children's Defense League, Uden Bond will work for the poverty law thing, and different blacks will do it different roles at different times, you understand? In New York City, one of the biggest labor union leaders is a black man who put Dinkins in office. You see? Well, you don't even hear his name out here because you don't belong to the labor union. You're not in New York City. Dinkins would not be elected if that guy hadn't lined up all the unions behind Dinkins. So you had another stage in history now. See? There are a lot of people who would like to be the black messiah. Every time I pick up a magazine, I'm seeing somebody else crown the black messiah. But it doesn't stick. The crown falls off right quick. It's just no, you know, we're not in that business anymore. And another thing, King was not all that by himself. What would you say about Thurgood Marshall who won all those cases before the Supreme Court? What would you say about Walter White who headed the NACP to get everything ready for Martin Luther King? Huh? What would you say about a Benjamin Mays who prepared all these Morehouse men to go out here and change the world? See, King didn't do that all by himself. You understand? You see? Mordecai Johnson ran all over this country giving the most fire to president of Harvard University. Yeah, if you ask me, he was one of the great intellectual leaders for about 30 or 40 years. He didn't write a book. He told me he didn't have time to write a book. But look at all the people Harvard University sent out because of Mordecai Johnson. You see, Adam Clayton Powell. Look at what he did. You are sitting in this cottage right now with whatever financial aid there is because of Adam Powell. He's the one that got the higher education act and all those loans and things through Congress. Six to seven pieces of legislature through the House Committee on Education and Labor. You can't take it from him. Lyndon Johnson wrote him a letter and said this was the best committee on education and labor he'd ever seen since he'd been in the Congress. Now, there's another term paper for you. Adam Thayden Powell and the House Committee on Education and Labor. <laughs> and those six or seven pieces of legislation. You don't, you don't have a term paper topic. There's one for you right now. You see what I mean? So if Adam Powell was standing over there and Benny Mays standing there, you know, and, and, and Thurgood Marshall standing right there, and A. Philip Randolph and the sleeping car porter standing, you would say, which one of you dudes was the main one? They say, well, who could say who was the main one? Mary McLeod Bethune, who could say who was the main one? You see, but King was the one that got shot. And that's why you're here today celebrating his death, his life because he laid down his life. He got shot. Medgar Evers, what would you say about Medgar? You know, when I was running the Peace Corps in Africa, Medgar was having such a hard time. I went down to Mississippi and I said, Medgar, give yourself a break. Come on, go back with me to Africa. I'll make you a deputy director for the Peace Corps in Western Nigeria. You'll learn all about Africa. And then when you come back after two years, you'll be stronger and better prepared. And everybody will be looking up to you. You've gone to Africa to live for two years. You'll understand. And he said, you know what he said to me? Sam, I can't leave Mississippi now. There's too much to do. In about nine months, he was dead. Does Medgar Evers belong in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, pantheon? You know, you see. So, so, so you can say King and you can say Malcolm, but that's not really quite the story. A whole lot of people contributed to that. And today, I doubt very seriously that you're ever going to see 
uh, that kind of a, of a messiah, for want of a better term, arise. Yes? Any other question? Yes, Professor? What do you do here? Uh, I work at Iowa University in Recreation Services. Recreation Services. Huh? Did you go to college here? Yeah, sure. Uh, you born and raised out here? No kidding. I never saw anybody born in Ames, Iowa before in my life. <laughs> Go right ahead. Well, now, now this, is a, this is a very important topic because in different aspects of life, there were different people. Now, my college president was the one who gave me more encouragement to go to graduate school and not to stop and take a little peanut job, go on and suffer and stay hungry a little while longer. And he was just a rural guy. He went to Oberlin and he went to Drew University. He was no great brain. He just believed in young people and pushed us. Without him, I wouldn't have done it. In theological seminary, Harry Emerson Fosdick, the renowned pastor of the Riverside Church, he was my theological model. He allowed the Protestant message to open up to all of the other disciplines and showed me how to reconcile, reveal religion to all of these other you know, liberal arts and sciences. And oh, he set my soul on fire. I'm indebted to him. You follow me? And there are other people here and there to whom I'm indebted for different sorts of things. Mordecai Johnson was a great model for me because he was a college president who also liked to think and liked to analyze things. He was not just a manager who hid in an office somewhere. He was out here on the platform all the time synthesizing ideas for the public. I greatly admired that. You follow me? And of course my dad was such a faithful and dutiful man that his shadow follows me everywhere I go. I can't even cuss when I get mad. I think he's watching over me somewhere. <laughs> so there are about five or six people, you know, that I would say were influences along with my grandmother, you see. And if there's not one person, and I know the same thing would be true in your life, it would not be one person that would be in me. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed being with you. <laughs> Thank you for coming.